The 28th of January, 1980, the United States Coast Guard cutter Blackthorn had just gotten underway from an extended dry dock and refit. It was sailing through the Tampa Bay Channel on a return trip to its home port. Many of its 50-person crew were newly reported on their first voyage to sea aboard the cutter. Tragically, for many, this would be their last voyage aboard the cutter. The Blackthorn was commissioned by the United States Lighthouse Service in 1943. She was laid down on the 21st of May of the same year in the Marine Ironworks and Shipbuilding Corporation in Duluth, Minnesota. Blackthorn was commissioned into the U.S. Coast Guard on the 27th of March in 1944. One of 39 Iris-class seagoing buoy tenders, hull number WLB TAC 391. 180-foot or 55 meters in length, or 37-foot or 11 meters at the beam, she was powered by two Cooper Bessemer MDEs and propelled by a single screw. She could go up to 13 knots and had a 48-man crew. By the time Blackthorn was launched, the United States was heavily involved in World War II. The cutter's first mission was breaking ice in the Great Lakes to clear the vital shipping channels. Places like the tank and aircraft plants in western Michigan needing the channels to transport important supplies like iron, steel, and coal. Shortly after around mid-1944, the vessel was transferred to sunny San Pedro, California. There, she would perform the normal multi-mission duties of a Coast Guard cutter, aids to navigation, law enforcement, and search and rescue. She performed this mission from the end of the war until the early 50s, when she was again transferred, this time home porting in Mobile, Alabama. During her time in Alabama, she continued her ATON mission, but also participated in a few well-known search and rescue cases. Responding to the collision between the motor vessel S.O. Greensboro and the motor vessel S.O. Suez, two oil tankers that collided in April of 1951. U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Blackthorn assisted in searching for survivors. Later on in February of 1953, she responded to the crashing of National Airlines Flight 470, the worst crash in National Airlines history. The Black Hole again assisted in the search for survivors. This time, there were none to be found. During her time in Alabama, she assisted the U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force in several search and rescue missions, searching for downed pilots in the Gulf of Mexico. Earning a positive reputation with the local military bases, she even assisted her sister ship, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Iris, WLB TAC 395, after she was holed and was forced to beach to keep from sinking. In her lifetime, the cutter had two refits or modernizations, one in 1968 and another in 1972. The first modernized the heating and ventilation systems, as well as adding more updated generators. The second adding highly appreciated refits for the crew's living quarters. Redone berthing areas, redesigned heads, even a new cruise lounge. Finally, in 1976, the cutter was reassigned for the last time, home ported in Galveston, Texas. It would head into Tampa Bay for another dockside in 1979, lasting until the beginning of 1980. After its refit, Blackthorn got underway on the evening of the 28th of January. She was making way out of the Tampa Bay Channel off the coast of Florida, heading home to Galveston, Texas. For several members of the crew, this would be the first voyage aboard the Black Hole. For nearly half the crew, this would be their last voyage. The ship had just had work completed on her main propulsion system. The captain, Lieutenant Commander George Seppel, had laid below to inspect the shaft tachometer on the main propulsion shaft. He left the executive officer, Lieutenant David Crawford, on the bridge, giving him the con before doing so. The deck was currently held by Ensign John Ryan. Downbound the channel, the buoy tender was overtaken on its port side by the outbound motor vessel Kazakhstan, a Russian passenger ship. Lieutenant Crawford maneuvered the cutter to the starboard side of the channel, allowing the passenger ship to overtake the slower cutter. Afterwards, he requested the captain to relieve the con. Instead, Lieutenant Commander Seppel ordered Ensign Ryan to take both the deck and the con. After this, Ensign Ryan ordered the Blackthorn back to port, but accidentally positioned the cutter almost to the exact middle of the channel. Meanwhile, inbound the channel was the 605-foot or 184-meter tanker motor vessel Capricorn. In the night, blinded by the lights of the well-lit Kazakhstan, neither Ensign Ryan nor the pilot aboard Capricorn noticed the other vessel until very late. 
Seeing the Blackthorn was in the center of the channel, the pilot aboard Capricorn attempted to contact her via radio to make passing arrangements, but was unsuccessful. Aboard the Coast Guard Cutter, the Captain and XO had returned to the bridge. They had even spotted the Capricorn and had initiated passing arrangements with her over the radio. Hearing a garbled, coming out of Anchorage, won't be in your way, come in as a response, they assumed the situation to be handled. This later turned out to be a vessel known as the Ocean Star, communicating with the motor vessel Kazakhstan. No further attempts were made by the Coast Guard to contact Capricorn. The Capricorn, being a larger vessel, was constrained by draft and was unable to deviate heavily from its course. The cutter being to the center of the channel prevented a port-to-port -port passing, as is most common in the rules of the road. The Capricorn came to port, which went unnoticed by the conning officer aboard the Coast Guard Cutter's bridge. In a last desperate attempt to avoid collision, Capricorn sounded two short blasts on the ship's whistle to signal a starboard-to-starboard -starboard passing. However, none of the bridge team reported hearing this sound signal. Assuming the Capricorn was maintaining her course and speed, Mr. Ryan ordered the cutter to turn 90 degrees to starboard to enter the Mullet Key Channel, bringing the cutter directly into Capricorn's path with only dozens of yards separating them. Seconds before impact, the Capricorn sounded five short rapid blasts, the international danger signal. None of these signals were returned by Blackthorn. Stepping onto the port bridge wing, Lieutenant Commander Seppel spotted the Capricorn bearing down on him and stated, where the expletive did he come from? He ordered immediate evasive maneuvers, throwing the throttles to full astern and sounding the collision alarm. Too late, however, to prevent a collision. At 2021, the Blackthorn and Capricorn collided. The Blackthorn collided nearly head-on with the 605-foot tanker. An anchor detail was set on the bow of the Coast Guard cutter and had only seen the large vessel at the very last moment. Most were able to evacuate the Foxhole, with the exception of a seaman Rhodes, who had been stationed on the bow as lookout, utilizing a sound-powered telephone. He wasn't able to unplug himself from the communication device fast enough and subsequently received non-life-threatening injuries. Below, on the mess deck, 20 off-duty members of the crew had mustered upon hearing the collision alarm. The more senior members set to work cracking out damage control equipment and setting material condition zebra throughout the ship. But six members were new to the ship and had gone to the aft passageway to inspect their WQSB billets to find out what role they filled for the casualty. Upon heading aft to close hatches, Machinery Technician Chief Rondal Laterrell found Machinery Technician First Class Bruce LaFond naked and seriously injured in the passageway outside his berthing, the apparently delirious engineer mumbling about an anchor in the shower. Entering the berthing area shower room to inspect the reported damage, Chief Laterrell found the anchor of the Capricorn had punched through the exterior of the Blackthorn. The anchor had torn a hole down the port side of the ship, embedding itself in one of the frames of the ship. On the bridge, the captain was fighting to take control of the ship and coordinate damage control efforts. He had ceased backing and stated he had started forward propulsion. This couldn't be determined. Divers reported finding the throttle position on the port bridge wing set to all stop. But the Capricorn, after having initially stopped itself, was now proceeding forward attempting to move away from the smaller vessel, not realizing its anchor was embedded in the side of the cutter. The chain for the vessel was dragging underneath the smaller ship. As Capricorn moved away, the anchor chain reached its bitter end before going taut. Suddenly and violently, the black hole listed aggressively to port at an extreme angle. Capsizing with shocking rapidity, the captain ordered an abandoning of the ship but due to the astonishing quickness, was unable to announce it over the ship's intercom circuit. Upon reaching a degree of greater than 45 degrees, the generators flipped off and the ship was thrown into pitch blackness. Crew stated later that they did not remember emergency lighting flipping on. Crewmen scrambled off the vessel. Some attempted to dislodge the tied-down life rafts, but were unable to do so fast enough. Inside the ship, several members were quickly lost and disoriented losing their way in the dark, unfamiliar, and now upside-down cutter. One young seaman found the escape shuttle access to the engine room and called to two others that he had found a way out. Climbing up into the engine room, now located at the top of the vessel. Realizing his error, he turned around and climbed down towards the upper decks. He swam the rest of the way out of the capsized cutter, but upon surfacing, realized he was not followed out. 
In total, 20 Coast Guardsmen went down with the vessel. Another three made it out, but subsequently drowned for varying reasons. After diving in search for bodies, two were found outside the ship on the buoy deck, but had been caught up and pulled down by equipment and rigging. One individual was found in the fantail hatch, his foot caught in the wire railing of the ladder, and a life jacket strap caught in the hatch. The vast majority were found in the engine room, having been there during the collision, manning their billet, or having accidentally swam down there after getting turned around in the dark, overturned hull. The majority were new members, having been aboard Blackthorn less than three months, or even in the Coast Guard less than a year. Twelve of the listed dead were so young, they listed only their parents as their next of kin. The collision was the worst peacetime tragedy in Coast Guard history. Several changes were made to Coast Guard policy following this incident. Subsequent investigations determined major deficiencies in training, drills, and even physical fitness exams. Sweeping changes were implemented, included requiring OODs to successfully complete a navigational rules test. New crewmen were now required to train in emergency ship egress and abandoning ship drills on their very first day aboard. And Coast Guard recruits now had to pass a new swim test that was twice the distance and included drown proofing training. Blackthorn was refloated for its investigation, at the time being deemed unsalvageable. With the bodies removed, she was sank as an artificial reef and a reminder in Tampa Bay. But her story wasn't over. 20 years later, the story of one seaman apprentice came to light. Seaman apprentice William Flores was one of the 23 deceased on Blackthorn, but his heroic actions may have kept that number from being much higher. He was awarded the Coast Guard Medal, the highest honor for non-combat bravery. His write-up reading as follows. Seaman Apprentice Flores is cited for heroism on the evening of 28 January 1980 while serving aboard U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Blackthorn. Immediately after the collision between SS Capricorn and U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Blackthorn near the entrance to Tampa Bay, Florida, Blackthorn rolled to port and capsized before the ship's personnel could prepare for an orderly abandoned ship. Exhibiting composure beyond his shipboard experience, Seaman Apprentice Flores joined another Blackthorn crew member in making their way to the starboard life jacket locker, and commenced throwing life jackets over the side to fellow crew members in the water. Later, as the Blackthorn began to submerge and his companions abandoned ship, Seaman Apprentice Flores remained behind to strap the life jacket locker door open with his own belt, thereby contributing to the survival of struggling shipmates who retrieved life jackets as they floated to the surface. Even after most of the crew members abandoned ship, Seaman Apprentice Flores, with complete disregard for his own safety, remained on the inverted hull to assist trapped shipmates and provide aid and comfort to injured and disoriented shipmates. His exceptional fortitude, remarkable initiative, and courage throughout this tragic incident were instrumental in saving many lives and resulted in the sacrifice of his own life. Seaman Apprentice Flores' courage, selflessness, and devotion to duty are most heartedly commended and are in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. He was recognized 20 years to the day after his death. Commissioned in 29 November 2011, the Coast Guard's third 154-foot Sentinel-class fast response cutter was named the U.S. Coast Guard William Flores, WPC TAC 1103 named after the young brave Coastie, barely a year out of basic training, who selflessly gave his life so that others may live.